Ladies and gentlemen, don't be afraid. It's just your friendly neighborhood log monster. Your host, Justin Beach. gentlemen, Dave Tampkin and company. Hey, Hi. that's right. Thanks for Let's having hear us, it Justin. From our small socially distanced audience. Let's hear it for these guys, shall we? How are you, Dave? Doing well. Thanks for having us. It's good to be uh, on stage at Longmont Museum with uh, my good friends Brad Huffman and Chadzilla Johnson. Brad and Chadzilla. Good Hello. to meet you guys. It's nice to have you here. Thanks for joining us. This is the Long Monster House Band. Exciting, exciting stuff. Um, what have you been up to, Dave? Uh, I've been doing a lot of lawn work lately. Lawn so, work? Yes, lawn. I work. thought you said long work, which lawn I thought was very work. appropriate. Uh, yes, been planting seeds, mowing. I've lost a lot of friends uh, just talking about it, actually, on a <laughs> daily basis. So, It's right up there in Boulder County with yes. the way, yeah. Yeah, causes of... Not much Demise. else to do. Yeah, right. Do you have a green thumb? Would you say you have a green thumb? I would, I would not say that. You would not say no. that? No. What color is your thumb? Um, well, I got bit by a dog last week, so it was red and purple oh. for most of the week, but it's better now. Did you know the dog? Uh, we know each other closely now, uh, <laughs> oh, but not yeah. so much at the time. Very good, very good. You still on good terms? You guys still? Yes. It good. Was, it was most likely my fault. And it's still connected to your hand, I see, so that's good. I'm glad you narrowly escaped uh, total, absolute um, horror or something. Yeah. It was a yeah. chihuahua. Oh, they're the worst. Those little, little mouths. Watch, you gotta watch those. I was a bit by a chihuahua on the leg once, actually. Anyway, uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is the Long Monster. And, uh, you know, according to the Longmont Chambers website, a long monster is anyone invested, engaged in, and or in love with Longmont. Whether we, you were born and raised here, moved here from somewhere else entirely, work or attend events here, you're a long monster. That's right. And um, I should say that the long monster is, of course, a talk show where yours truly chats with accomplished locals about what they do, how they do it, and what it means to be doing it here in dear old Colorado. It's an investigation into Longmont itself where the mysteries of Longmont are revealed. Yes, we'll attempt to answer some big questions like, what is Longmont? Where is Longmont? And who's ever been there? And who better to answer these questions than, than yours truly, some middle-aged, lanky, white dude from Southern California. That's right, I ain't from around here, as you may have guessed. I'm, I just barely know squat about this town, to tell you the truth. I can't tell my longs peak from my meeker. That's right. Anyway, how's your 2020 going? What a year, right? Don't touch your face. Wash your hands, wear that mask, drive that truck, wave that flag, vote. We're getting tired of it, aren't we? We're getting sick, sick of COVID, sick of politics. That's right, America's patience is wearing real thin, while America's COVID patients are wearing those real thin hospital gowns. I don't really know, don't know who writes these, to tell you the truth. Seriously, folks, how about we take a little breather tonight? I think we could use one. Let's think about something else entirely. Something we all have in common. You guessed it. Tonight, all roads lead to Longmont. <laughs> right? Right. Isn't this the time where you start playing a little bit of music to get me over to the gas? <laughs> Well, all right. 
This is, of course, the premiere of The Long Monster. And before we really get going here, I need to uh, pay tribute and uh, thank a few people. And those people are our museum members, our museum donors, the friends of the Longmont Museum, the Scientific and Cultural Facilities District, otherwise known as a lot of words, or SCFD. Uh, the mighty KGNU Community Radio out of Boulder, Colorado. They are our media sponsor. And a special shout out to Woodley's Fine Furniture here, Longmont's own Woodley's Fine Furniture, for the excellent set here tonight. Um, you know, all of this furniture is for sale just down the road at Woodley's, and they're celebrating their 41st anniversary. Can you believe it? can't believe it. I know, I know. Anyway, come on down to Woodley's and check out what they've got on sale. I can't believe it. Such nice stuff. And you know, I don't know if you've ever been to a museum, let alone the Longmont Museum, but we've been here for like 85 years or something. Maybe not in this particular location, but in some form, shape, or another. Uh, we've been around a long time. Uh, this particular building landed here in about 2003-ish, and this lovely Stewart Auditorium was built just five years ago. So it's, it's pretty much a baby. Uh, it's, it's the museum's little baby, this, this auditorium, the Stewart. Um, and I'm the proud manager of it. It's a real blessing uh, to be able to run a little space like this, even amidst something like uh, a pandemic, even, where we can hardly have an audience. I want to welcome our online audience this evening, those of, you, those, of us, those of you who are streaming us live on Facebook, longmontpublicmedia.org, and local Comcast channel 8 slash 880. Welcome. It's, uh, it's, I'd say it's good to see you, but I, I can feel you. I feel you out there. I feel your energy. I want to thank you for it. Thanks for being here. Anyway, we've got lots of stuff happening here at the Longmont Museum. We've got our Day of the Dead exhibition up through the end of the year, if you haven't checked it out. It's actually our 20th anniversary exhibition of Day of the Dead. It's been kind of a month-long celebration. It just kind of culminated in a special performance this last uh, Sunday. Uh, here in this very room. It was quite the show. That's uh, available on Facebook if you want to check it out. And then the exhibition, as I mentioned, is up through the end of the year. And every Thursday night, I know, tonight's a Thursday night, isn't it? Every Thursday night we offer a program called Thursday Nights at the Museum. So the Long Monster is part of that series. Please do check us out every Thursday night at 7.30 on your Facebook, on your longmontpublicmedia.org or on local Comcast channel 880. Um, we are here for you every Thursday. That's right. Next week, we have a special program with uh, NCAR. It's their science series, and we're going to be exploring the sky and the clouds with a pilot, an NCAR pilot, and uh, one of their leading scientists. That should be exciting, I think. Anyway, without further ado, I'd like to introduce to you our first guest of our fir very first Long Monster program. Um, he is a local legend, really, an internationally renowned frugal guru whose secret goal, not so secret goal now, is to save the human race from consuming itself into oblivion. He's the man behind the blog known as Mr. Money Mustache. Please welcome Pete Adney to the Longmont Museum. Go on, take the money run. 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 Yes. Hey, Pete. Good evening, Justin. Thanks for being here. Um, thank you for inviting me to this amazing show, the first episode. Well, it just started yet. So, I don't know how amazing. We'll see how amazing it is. It's yeah, amazing yeah. that you're here. I think that's a big deal. Yeah, it was, I had to travel 1.5 miles to get to this museum. So. 1.5 miles <laughs> on your bike, right? It is true. I actually did bike here. That's right. You're kind of a bike. Are you, would you describe yourself as a bike nut? No. Uh, no, I would just describe myself as like a somewhat reasonable uh, transportation choosing person. I see. 
I, that's great. Yeah, that's great. Like 1.5 miles on a warm November night is obviously fine on a bike. So yeah. warm. That's right. We are having an unseasonably warm early November here. Um, I want to make a joke about hell or something, but anyway, um, I, I, I really appreciate you taking a break from your retirement uh, to join us. Um, yeah, tonight. Yeah, no, it wasn't too much strain to, to come here. What are you? Do you have? Do you hold the world record for uh, youngest retiree, or do you know who does? If you don't, oh, definitely not. So I was. I just stumbled into semi early retirement, and mm. I was um, 30 years old, but. Uh, it wasn't a very aggressive or like efficient program. So there's lots of people who do this younger than me. And I mean, the basic idea is just saving enough money that you can live off of the ongoing gains of that money. Right. Um, and it was easy for me, you know, like I had, didn't have children until later in life and had a good job and didn't have a lot of demands or like desires, just sort of, and I came from a different country too. Right, so, you, uh, went f you came from Canada, is that yeah. right? Yeah, so yeah. back in my day, like born in the 70s of, of Canada, um, it was exciting to like upgrade from a Honda Civic to like a Honda Accord, and that would be about like the glass ceiling of middle class life. So like I didn't even know the kind of stuff you Americans do with your money. So uh, when I got here and started making an American salary, um, it just naturally kind of just went into the bank. Well, I th you know, I think the, the Honda Accord for a lot of us in the 80s was kind of the was kind of a big deal. Yeah. It, was, yeah. it was kind of like the, one of the middle class, upper middle class cars of choice. It was practical. Yeah, but nowadays people will laugh at you if you have that. Like you have to have like a $60,000 pickup truck with all the like special princess chairs and upgraded knobby tires and stuff in order to be like making it nowadays. I mean, that's what I drive, yeah. <laughs> what do you drive? A bike. You drive a bike. Oh, yeah. that's right, that's right. You drive a bike. Nice yeah, motorcycle. I have a lot of bikes, so. You drive, a, you drive an electric bike, is that right? Uh, well, you, you did catch me. Today, I took an electric bike here because I was in a rush. But, but I, that's not cheating. I would normally drive like, you know, a normal muscle-powered bike. You know. do, you, do you ride one of those like bike messenger bikes, the fixy kind of things? Do you have any of those? Uh, I have one of those. You do? Yeah. 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 I mean, it's not super fixy. Like, you can still coast because oh, okay. I think it's very pretentious if you have it locked in. And some yeah. people have those things like with no brakes, so you have to like just reduce your pedaling, and that's, you know, I'm very, I'm a moderate gentleman. I mean, this is like going to be the theme of this interview is I'm not extreme in any way. Are you extreme in your moderation? God damn. I damn. knew it. I knew I'd get him on that one. I knew it. No, because in some ways I'm extreme in a genuinely extreme way, so. You're extreme in a genuinely I'm extreme way. You're, genu you're genuinely, yeah. you're extremely genuine. Yeah. Okay. I think I'll take. Yeah, I would take that. Um, do you ever think about? I mean, you, you moved here from Canada. Do you ever think like, hey, maybe I uh, shouldn't have done that? Oh, uh, that's probably a political reference you're making. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, I mean, there are some of us out there. I, I I know some people who are like, I, you know, if things don't go the way I hope they're going to go, I'm I'm, you know, I'm thinking yeah. about going north. And if you look at those Google search results for like how to move to Canada, like right. it always happens whenever. Yeah. Are you researching an election that? Happens? What's that? You're not researching how to move to Canada. Uh, no, I mean, I could go back to Canada any time because I'm a dual citizen, but right. um, America is actually quite good. You know, I'm like a flag-waving, eagle-worshipping uh, <laughs> citizen now, and um, I like it here. You know, like, it's true. I, I admit, like, the politicians are, can be clowns, for sure. Well, yeah, I mean, but that's, that's nothing new, right? I mean, we've always known that politicians It's a little bit new, to be honest. Yeah. Justin, things have become much more clown-like recently. But um, it doesn't affect your life, and that's a real thing. Like, your core life can be excellent regardless of what the politicians are doing. And if you're on a news fast, which I kind of am, mm, I'm just mm -hmm. like, don't even read it, definitely don't watch it, and just focus on stuff I can control, um, like having fun in Longmont and hanging out with friends and going on the Long Monster TV show. Yeah, yeah. Then yeah. Uh, life is pretty good. Yeah, there won't be a whole lot of uh, news alerts tonight. Um, yeah. Yeah, no news flashes, no, no tricking you into thinking we have new numbers or anything like that. Oh, yeah. Right. <laughs> right. Well, yeah, that's, we, don't, we don't play those tricks. We don't play those tricks. So tell me, so you, uh, you originally, when you moved uh, from Canada, you landed in Boulder and like most folks, you migrated, like a lot of people, myself included, you, you migrated to Longmont. 
Yeah, that's true. So I moved to Boulder at 24 years old in order to work as a software engineer. And then uh, to buy my first house, I had to move to Louisville because that was the closest place I could afford to buy a house way back then. Right. And then lived there the whole working career and then moved to Longmont as a retirement destination. So Longmont was like, ah, like the like going to the beach to like kick back and you know no longer have to work anymore. Yeah. And so that was in 2005. So we, and then we had a my wife at the time and I had a baby born around then. So now there's a almost 15 year old boy, young man, in town who's spent his whole life here, and I think it was a good choice. It's been a good 15 years here. Yeah. What, so what, is, what, what, would, what are some of your favorite things about Longmont, would you say? Um, definitely number one is the St. Vrain River Creek and all the greenway yeah. stuff right. around there, like the beautiful trails and bike paths, and you can just walk. So like pretty much the foundation of my job as a dad, and the reason I consider myself a good dad is basically I just took my son there, and we would just play in the forest and play in the creek and make dams and stuff, pretty much like you know, a few times a week, every week of his life so far. Like, that's the foundation of our time together. And so having a natural area like that in the town is really the best thing, and a lot of people use it and enjoy it. It's also a good transportation corridor. You know, you can get from my house to anywhere, because my house kind of backs onto that area. Mm -hmm. So that's number one. Number two is, like, the old town, downtown area, because it's very walkable. Yeah. And between 2005 and now, we've seen quite the renaissance. Like, it used to be just, like, pawn shops, gun shops, empty stores, and then, like, the pump house. That was all we had downtown. And now it's completely different. We have, like, fantastic restaurants and dryland distilleries and all these other places. And I have a business on Main Street now, too. Oh, right, right. So um, it's kind of like, and the nice apartment buildings and everything that replaced the slaughterhouse. <laughs> right. So it's, like, it's really... Uh, Quite a, quite a revolution for a small town. Yeah, we got we kind of got out of the slaughtering turkey business, didn't yeah. we? Yeah, 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 yeah. That, that was, was a good move. That was an upgrade. And now Wibby Brewing is pretty much mm -hmm. in part of that space, Wibby? which is yeah. like the best brewery and like place to hang out and have outdoor beers ever. Mm. So all this stuff has happened since I moved here, and so Longmont is kind of on the way up. As a as a as a Longmont newbie. Uh, are there any, are any, any kind of like secret Longmont things that I should be aware of? Um, I don't know. Like I'm, I don't have a lot of insider cultural secrets. I'm more of the nature guy. So if you want to okay. know how to ride your bike somewhere, I've got all the shortcuts and like the parking lots and trails you cut through. Okay. So you, you know, you know which, you know which, uh, which parking lots to cut through. Yeah, I know yeah. where all the jumps are and the you fun, know where all the jumps are. Fun dirt single tracks and stuff. I think I'm, I'm not really going off many jumps these days. I just, I kind of gave on. up on jumping. We're approximately the same age. You can, Appro still, you can still jump on bikes. Yeah, yeah, maybe I need to start training for that. This whole <laughs> COVID thing, it's really kind of gotten the better of my uh, exercise regimen a little bit. Oh, did you say it's improved your exercise or gotten? It did for like a week. <laughs> I, 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 for a week there, I was like really grooving. I was doing yoga every day. I was lifting some. I was lifting my little weights. So like um, March third through ninth, it was good, and then <laughs> maybe more like March twentieth through twenty seventh mm. or something. But yeah, yeah, there was. I was on a real exercise tear there for a little bit, and okay. then I've just gone to you know. I'm sorry I, to hear that. Yeah, yeah. I've got. I you know I was, I had a COVID. I think my COVID fifteen has turned into COVID nineteen actually, and going on twenty. Here. Anyway, um, tell me a little bit about the uh, Mustachian Nation. Um, okay, so that's like my writing accidental yeah. career. Okay, yeah. so I started, retired in 2005, mm -hmm. um, just lived normal retired life, and then gradually started to realize like not everybody was doing the same thing that I assumed they were. Like I thought they we would all do this. And then uh, I was like, oh, wow, okay, I better start explaining um, how this works. So I started a blog. Uh, called Mr. Money Mustache, where I, I wrote out the principles of like how to run your life and be a little bit more efficient with your money and kind of maximize your fun while min minimizing your spending in 2011. And then um, it unexpectedly took off a little bit on the internet, so more and more readers were coming in, and that encouraged me to keep doing it. So now I've been doing this, I guess, nine years or something, and it's become like a little bit of an insider cult um, situation and 
it's, we call it the fire movement now. And right. now it, so there's like, if you look up fire movement or Mr. Money Mustache, you see a bunch of like interesting things that have happened, like news articles, like New York Times or whatever, Washington Post stuff, which has really helped bring more people in, which encouraged me further. And uh, so it's advancing that mission that you mentioned before I walked out here, which is to get this idea of like lowering consumption for kind of middle class or even upper income people and getting them excited about a bicycle and, you know, like, don't, just don't spend all your money trying to be super fancy. And, and then you have a balance. You're consuming less. You have just as much fun. You can quit work decades earlier. And you're consuming about 75% less natural resources. And that's attractive to some people? I don't know. I mean, I, mean, I, I'm a, I have to say that I'm a, I'm a bit of a fancy pants. And yes, so am I, as you can yeah. see. I mean, I'm on your TV show. How That's this true. That's Obviously, fancy. Obviously, I'm fancy. It's pretty and so fancy. Like 30, about, so my website alone, about 30 million people, mostly in this country, have drifted through over these years. So I think it's like it's kind of catching on. And, All right. Uh, I'm okay. not sure. It sounds like you're not a reader yet. But I, well, you know, I have to say that in preparation, and, you know, it, this takes an incredible amount of preparation. I mean, <laughs> incredible. Really huge. And um, yeah, so I, I spent some time on your blog. Absolutely, absolutely. But you know, I, I'm, I, tomorrow I'm going to sign up for the new iPhone, I think. So I, 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 don't, know, I don't know how we're going to turn around this aircraft carrier. You know, it's like, of, of, I mean, I've, I've got, I don't know, I don't know how we're going to get me off of the uh, fanciness. Uh, I, you know, I, 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 I don't know. I don't know how we're going to do well. it. We'll have to do I that just need a to read future your blog episode more. where we're going to analyze your lifestyle and we'll do like one of those intervention reality Do you do TV interventions? Shows. Well, for you, I might. Oh, my God. This would be good. This would, you know, maybe, maybe the next time we do a long monster, I'll be a changed man. I, that would... Yeah, and you can have a flannel shirt as well. I have a flannel. I have a, I have a, I think I have a flannel shirt. And we'll ride our bikes here together. And right. Yeah. I do have bikes, but I, I don't know what else I... Yeah, they're in my garage. That's 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 where they like to be in my garage, um, against the wall, leaning against the wall there with flat <laughs> tires. Um, and you you have been you have a little um, co-working space in town. Oh yeah, so yeah. that's the more recent story. Is in 2017, um, I bought a kind of dilapidated building next to a pawn shop, uh, but it's in a really nice part of Main Street of Longmont, across from the Longs Peak Pub, which is kind of one of the best spots um, and then restored it to life you know like it was really cheap found it on craigslist actually but because i'm a carpenter kind of for my main passion in life uh, along with friends we restored it brought it into being in nice condition and then started a co-working space in there which is sort of like a community gathering area where people work but we also have an outdoor gym and we have a workshop you know like a maker space and you can borrow tools and just all kinds of stuff. Like anything you can think of there, um, that's, we add it to the co-working space. And it's really, I, I joke that it's called a friend harvesting machine. Right, Because right. it's all about like taking the idea of like a website where you meet people from all over the world, but they're not your real friends. And instead, you can do that locally. And then they are, everyone is real friends with each other. And after three years, that is really proving to be a great, you know, great situation for all of us. And we all help each other with our businesses and with our lives, and we lend each other tools and bikes and go on camping trips and all this other stuff. I think we, I think I, I, you know, I hope that the Long Monster will be a friend harvesting machine too. I, that's, that's what I aspire oh, yeah. for it to be. It do you think be. that's a good idea, Dave? I do. What's the name of the co working space? Oh, my co-working yeah. space? Uh, it's called HQ, or the full name is like Mr. Money Mustache Headquarters Co-working, but nobody wants to say that. So it's just HQ Co-working. Where and can we find that on uh, Instagram or Facebook? Um, I think if you just type MMMHQ Co-working, you'll see it, or Longmont Co-working. It'll probably lead to that, because there's not a lot of competitors here in town. Chad, I think we should uh, stop by tomorrow. What do you think? Yeah, Let's do it. Right. I'll come meet you there. It's 712 Main Street. and uh, 712 Main Street. We we'll got be three there. beer. Yeah. We got places to plug in the instruments if you want to jam. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. Well, you know, I think we've reached the, I, I, this little interview has gone way too fast. And maybe we, we need to have you back sometime here. I hope this won't be the first and last 
It sounds good. Well, monster experience. Yeah, I would be honored to be a, like a recurring filler candidate. Filler? When you, when you can't no, get no, you are guests. not filler. There's nothing. Yeah. Fi no, no, no. You're very filling. I mean, but but yeah, you're not filler. <laughs> no. Um, uh, speaking of filling, would you would you mind filling the end of the couch for the duration of the program? Oh, will you hang to, out with us? Yeah, I'd love to stick around. Oh, fantastic! And see what, fantastic. what else happens tonight? I'm going to invite our next next guest up. Um, she is a spiritual healer, writer, poet, playwright, performance artist, speaker, and facilitator who brings a highly creative back background to her distinctive presentational form of racial justice activism. Her storytelling inspires awareness and insight about the everydayness of race in our lives and the power we have to bring paths of healing to our future. Her writing and poetry about race is used enthusiastically by educators across the country. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Norma Johnson to the Longmont Museum. Ground control to major tone. Ground control to major tone. And put your helmet on Ground control to Major Tom Hey Norma, we're on a talk show! <laughs> and I love it! This is crazy! <laughs> is this the, is this you got the, the whole setup here too. Very I know, nice. right? Very nice. It's, it's almost like we're in Burbank or something. Burbank! <laughs> you know Burbank? Mm. You know, I spent a little time there. Is that right? Yeah, that right? it's a hot I heard, place. I heard something about that. <laughs> yeah. I heard something about that. How are you? I'm great. Yeah? I am. What have you been up to? Mm. Oh, I've had some fun gigs. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Zoom gigs? Zoom, yes. Yes. I'm still learning. Yeah. It's a, it's a different form of presentation. It is? Yeah. Are you embracing it? Or are you... Yeah, I yeah. mean, I'm grateful, you know, because oh. actually a lot more people have opportunity to attend that aren't local, so it's mm -hmm. nice, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what, what kind of work are you, what kind of Zoom stuff are you doing? Are you doing a lot of... Um, mostly like workshop forms. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. just uh, working with organizations, just recently worked with the uh, Colorado Parks and Wildlife. Mm-hmm co-facilitated a workshop for them on uh, equity, diversity, and inclusion. Ah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. And you're in, uh, I, I, I don't know how to break this to our audience, but you actually uh, live in Boulder. I do. Yeah. Yes. That's okay. That's okay. <laughs> it's, the same, it's the same county, um, and we embrace, we, we embrace people from other cities uh, within the county within Boulder County here in Longmont. All are welcome, even, even people from Weld and, uh, <laughs> you know, Denver. Uh, you know, I mean, I, I mean, even people from California, they welcome them here. I mean, I'm from, we're both from California. Yeah. And when you I've first moved there. here, you lived in Longmont. I did, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I lived here for a few years. And where, 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 what part of Longmont were you in? Um, up at the north end. Yeah, that's yeah, where near I am. Near 66. Okay, yeah, me too. Mm -hmm. That's where I am at. That's mm -hmm. where I am at. Which was, you know, at that time, it was like farmland and stuff. It was nice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's still, it's okay. It's, it's still rather nice up there, depending, depending. Um, yeah, Ute Highway. Yes. Right? 66. Yes, yeah, Ute right. Highway. Mm -hmm. um, and how's Boulder treating you? Oh, pretty good. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. I've been there a good while now. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, I we when we uh, chatted, we chatted about this show some months ago, and we talked about how uh, how you know Boulder does have this reputation of being rather um, pale. It seemed to be an awful. I, I don't know if you've noticed this. Anybody who's ever been to Boulder, there are a lot of white people in Boulder, and uh, what seems like a distinct lack of of color. Mm-hmm. I've noticed that. You've noticed that. I Have did. you noticed that? Mm -hmm. How how what is it like to live in Boulder and be like uh, kind of, I mean you must sometimes feel like the uh, sort of the the token black person or something. Is that? Yeah, sometimes I am. Yeah. Sometimes I am, but it's been the place that's inspired a lot of my work. Mm. 
I don't know if I'd be doing the kind of work I did or writing the kind of things that I do if I hadn't been living in Boulder. Right. Mm -hmm. And that work is, is healing. It's healing. Um, it's writing. Um, I do poetry, short stories, playwright. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's uh, been an inspirational place. Right. Mm -hmm. Would you say it's been uh, more inspirational than your time in Los Angeles? Oh, Los Angeles. Do you, do you remember yeah. those days? Burbank, yeah. Well, it was a different life. Mm -hmm. It was yeah. a different life. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you weren't, you weren't, it wasn't writing, you were performing, were you performing back then? Um, I've always kind of been performing some, at least on the side. Yeah. But actually, I was a costumer in the mm -hmm. entertainment industry. That's right. Yeah. Any, any uh, shows we might be familiar with? Um, well, there was um, Star Trek, Next Generation. Oh, uh, yeah, I've heard of that one. Yeah? Yeah. And um, Tonight Show with Jay Leno. Well, hot damn. Yeah. Um, who's, this, who's wardrobe? This talk show is not new for me. Oh, no, yeah, this isn't your first rodeo, which is actually a reference to our next guest. Anyway, um, yeah. So you were you J Leno's... Uh, Ward, uh, wardrobe guy, costume guy? Actually, I was Brantford Marcellus. Oh, wardrobe. Oh, oh, that's yeah, cool. person. Mm -hmm. You and know, the, Jay Leno band. almost ran me over in a gas station in Studio City once. He was driving some big car with big wheels on it, some like 19, you know, 18 ridiculous <laughs> clown tractor car, and he just about ran me down. He loves his car. You know, every day. He would drive a different car or truck or motorcycle to the lot every day. But he always wore the same clothes. Mm. <laughs> he always loved to wear a jean shirt and jeans. That's it. Yeah. He's not a fancy guy. He just loved cars. I also noticed his head. He's got a really big head. Mm. I don't mean like that. I mean like physically. He's yeah. large, large Yeah, it's the head. jaw. Yeah. Yeah, it's a yeah. long jaw. Yeah, long, mm -hmm. long jaw. Yeah, but um, he's and a sweetheart. Yeah, he seems like a nice guy. Um, so, who, what do you, what sort of wardrobe or costume work were you doing on Star Trek: Next Generation? Um, actually, some of everything. Uh, I would uh, construct costumes, and I would also work the set. So, you know, I've been on the set when um, they're attacked, and you know, actually, everybody just moves a lot. Uh, uh, right. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, in unison. Yeah. 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 That's funny. The set doesn't move. <laughs> Weren't, didn't you tell me that you were Picard's when he was when when Jean Luc Picard? Not that I know anything about this, ladies and gentlemen. I'm not a Trekkie. I'm not. But. Um, Weren't you Jean-Luc Picard's uh, Borg? You were like the Borg costume person. I was. When he yeah. was a Borg, yeah, I was his costumer. That's pretty cool. It's I very cool. I think a lot of people yeah. are really geeking out right now on Facebook oh, watching yeah. this. <laughs> They're probably sharing it everywhere. Aren't you? I think you are. Um, anyway, so that was the old you. And then you, uh, you lived in L When were you in L.A.? Oh, yeah, the years. There for well, a while? It was about, it was about uh, I left about 22 years ago. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 20, yeah, maybe 25 now. Mm -hmm. And you actually lived in Altadena, and I'm, I'm from Pasadena, so we were yeah. very, very kind of close. And I lived in neighbors. Pasadena, too. Oh, you did? I did. Okay. On Fair Oaks. Oh, you did? Yeah. Oh, my. You guys don't know. We, don't, we, we need to yeah. talk about Hover and <laughs> Ken Pratt. We shouldn't be talking about <laughs> Fair Oaks and Pasadena. Um, and so what, did, what, what, what led you to uh, moving to, to Colorado? Were you just like, I want to get out of the rat race? Yeah, I had a friend down. here, and um, it was time. You ever have just, it's time? Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I'm, here I am. Yeah. yeah, so it was time to shift, and I could also feel that I was moving out of the industry, because my, my first love and my first piece in the industry was actually theater, live, live theater, opera, like that. So... As a wardrobe person? Or as, as a wardrobe, oh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. costumer. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I used to make the costumes. 
And um, so when I came here to Colorado, I worked at Denver Center, mm, um, right. creating costumes there for a little while. By the way, you look fantastic tonight. Your outfit is so perfectly coordinated. Well, thanks. It's, the colors are really nice. Yeah. yeah, wardrobe's fun. Yeah, it totally yeah. is. I agree. <laughs> it's fun. Um, did you bring anything? I think maybe you brought something to share with us, maybe a, a poem. Yeah. Um, you know, these, these are, I, you know, these are hard times. We're going through some very mm -hmm. stressful times, um, and it's, it's, it's hard on a lot of people. And I think we underestimate just how, how, how COVID and um, the social and political unrest that we've been going through is, is affecting us. So um, if, if you have something to share with us that, that might kind of... Yeah, you know, I brought, um, I did bring a poem. I brought a few because I wasn't sure. But, um, you know, I just want to say that, you know, you're talking about hard times, and this isn't the first hard times. Um, I think we have short-term memory a lot. But um, I think a lot of it is always about remembering, remembering who we really are and uh, the power that we really have. We can change things. We can make things move. Um, we have that power. And at the core of it, um, at the core of it is love like remembering what that really is. So, so this piece I'm going to share is called Let Love Win. What do you say to letting love win? Is it painful? Does it hurt? Is it frightening? Does it take you by surprise when they love you like you've always wanted? What do you say to letting love win? Is there a crack of least resistance where it can sink in and slowly replenish the dry, dry desert in your heart? What do you say to letting love win? Do you speak it all? Are there words of grace and belovedness or only the fire from your parched and lonely dwelling place of your insecure and frightened mind? What if you said, I let love win? Would the rocks come tumbling down the mountain and crush your soul? Or would a fire catch hold that you could never put out? Gorgeous. Here's to letting love win. Boy, do you feel like you, you were saying how do you feel like that we've forgotten our, our power or our ability to, to transform? I think we do. I think, I think we're in and out of that, you know, all the time. Mm. Because we get swept away with the news. We get swept away with a lot of factors that are trying to control what people do. Um, but I think when we stop and, um, and stop, you know, just stop that motion and remember when you were talking about being in nature, right? That's that kind of time when we can um, remember and reconnect. But um, I think fanning those flames is always worth it. Mm. Fanning the flames of love. Of love, yeah, of remembering. Yeah. Of just remembering who we really are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a kind of waking up. I, but, you know, I, so I feel... I feel like we're, we're talking a lot about, you know, people are talking a lot about being woke. Mm -hmm. um, so there's this, there's this element of being awake now, um, but there's also this element of being very much not so, it seems like. And, and it's interesting that those two things can coincide like that. Well, being woke, um, 
first you have to understand you've been asleep. Mm -hmm. so, um, so I think we're waking up to ourselves. We're waking up to who we are, to who we've been, to what we've been participating in. And um, I think that makes us consider where we want to go and what we want to create now. How do you how do you feel that we how do we go about he, how do you think we go about healing this kind of divide this incredible intense polarization that we're experiencing these days what can an individual do do you think well I think it's it's a lot of different things I think again that essence of who we are um, because when we remember that then we we're, we're generating and fulfilling ourselves in our own power instead of trying to look for power on the outside. So that naturally directs us to what's best for us, um, what we're passionate about that can be a form of, that we can serve in you know, our communities and our world mm -hmm. in. I didn't know I'd be writing and doing poetry about race. I didn't know that. Uh, it just came through me, you know, through being inspired through being angry, actually. Mm -hmm. You know, my anger took me to that place. But here I am doing it, and people are using my work all over the place. So um, it's, it's helped me heal, you know, and it's helped me to remember, like, who I am, and it's given me a channel to follow uh, that I can do this, that I can help create the kind of change that I want. And everybody, everybody can do that. So you worked through, you worked, you passed through anger to get here. Where was that, when did you experience that anger? Were you experiencing that in, here in Colorado? Was that, was that in Boulder? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. in, in some ways, it's just a part of my life, you know, being black skin in this country. So uh, I'm always navigating anger. Um, but I have to decide what to do with it because it'll eat you up. Yeah. You know, so to find creative expression that's actually useful. Um, I was actually surprised, you know, when I started creating the poems that it was useful to somebody else outside of me. I didn't know that. Uh, but um, now, you know, they move out and they have a life of their own. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Do you have. Uh do you have hope for where we are now? Do you, do you feel us coming out of this dark period? Well, like I said, our, we have a lot of short-term memory. This hasn't been the darkest by any means. Right. And um, I, I think I always have hope. I don't always remember that I have it. Mm -hmm. But... It's been generated in me, you know, just through my lineage. I'm a descendant of hope. Mm. So uh, it, it's not even a, a, a concept to not carry it forward. Mm. A descendant of hope. Absolutely. Or is that is that unique to you, or you do you feel are we are we all descendants of hope, or are we all some of us descendants of of other, I think other we're all descendants of hope if we choose to claim it. Uh. Because um, there's a tendency for things to be divided into black and white, literally and not. Um, but as human beings, we have so many shades of being. You know, even the person that does the worst acts imaginable may still love their family. They may still, you know, it's, it's just not that, that those divisions that we draw um, is just something that we do. But I think we can all claim that hopeful place because we all have it in our ancestry, we all have it in our homes, we all have it in our communities. It's there everywhere. Look at us sitting here now, you know, enjoying this time. You created this whole venue to serve and uplift the community. So um, don't you think that's hopeful? I think so, yeah, yeah. You know, and I'm, I'm struck that, you know, what you're describing, the kind of work you're describing to kind of 
improve things. I, I feel like Peter is also engaged in that. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like you're both both doing what you can in your unique ways to to improve things for people, to improve the world, to make the better the bet the the world a better place to live for for all of us. Um, and I think that's really really incredible. Um, I think it's probably time to. Uh, Welcome our next guest. I would like you to uh, stick around, Norma. Our next guest will be joining us um, over the internet, virtually, from beyond. Um, so you can stay seated right where you are. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, Pete, you can continue to occupy that corner of the couch. You look really, just, it suits you. You look Thank good you. over there. Yeah. I chose my clothes to go with this Woodley's fine furniture couch. Yeah, well done, well done, well done. You must have been spying on us as I was sort of shopping at Woodley's. Um, you know, um, I, I, some people may be expecting uh, Bridget Law to join us this evening. She is out of the country, believe it or not. Um, she's safe, as far as I know, and she's, she's visiting uh, Canada actually. Um, so instead, uh, we have a special treat. Uh, another person all the way from Boulder. Um, our next guest, let's see if I can find my note card here. It's here somewhere. Aha, uh -huh. here we go. Our final guest this evening hardly needs an introduction. She's a celebrated historian, a bona fide public intellectual, and a MacArthur Fellow. She's the author of Desert Passages, The Legacy of Conquest, A Ditch in Time, The City, The West, and Water, and countless essays. She's been a guest columnist for the New York Times and currently writes a monthly column for the Denver Post, as well as a blog, This Is Not My First Rodeo. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the director of CU Boulder's Center of the American West, Patty Limerick, back to the Longmont Museum. Guys, Patty, welcome to the Long Monster. Thank you so much for having me. What a lovely musical intro that was. The Wild Wild West. Is that yeah. what's the name of that song? Uh, wild Wild West. Wild Wild. There's two wilds. Yes. <laughs> two. Yeah. yeah. I'm yeah, ready you, to go for three or four. We yeah, you. I, I didn't ready. want to push it. You didn't want to yeah. push it. Yeah. Okay. Too many okay. wilds. If you, is the is the West still wild, Patty? <laughs> well, let me talk about that a little more. Uh, yes, in uh, lots of ways. In terms of, okay, fundamental definition of wild, something that I cannot possibly predict and that surprises me all the time, really wild. Really um, wild, yeah, right. The wild, uh, wild life, still quite a bit of it, considering everything that's happened to wildlife. Uh, improbable cast of characters, that's, we certainly have that. And I think we might be more peculiar in temperament and personality than we were in the 19th century, I guess. I don't know. So I'm just... Doing my best here, Justin, but I don't mm -hmm. quite have a grip on the word wild. Right. And I may even have a grip on the word west, if you really push me on this. But I, I think there is so much going on that is so interesting and so compelling and so worth the world's attention. So if that's a definition of wild, I'm going with it. Okay. Yes, I agree. I agree. This is, it's a wild, it's definitely a wild time here in the west, in the western world. Um, we're both from California. You grew up in Banning, and you know I, I grew up in Pasadena, a little a little north. Um, but I, you know, growing up, I never really thought of us as living, you know, as, as Western. This didn't. We I didn't feel like I was living in a, a Western. When moving to Colorado, I felt like, oh, this is the West. You know, this is California. Never really felt like the West to me. Do you know what I'm talking about? 
You know what I'm getting at? I don't. I lived on, I, Banning, California is on the edge of the desert. Right. Uh, it doesn't have the amenities of Pasadena. Right. Any class struggle here, but different. Um, and it had forest fires. It had uh, an important Indian reservation on oh. the edge of, edge of town. There okay. was a cabbage to the north of, of town. Uh, we had, we actually were kind of uh, ahead of the interior west in terms of having Palm Springs as a resort town with my hometown was where the working people, the janitors, the maids, uh, the groundskeepers for Palm Springs lived there. So in some ways we were kind of ahead of the game in terms of the pattern of As Aspen or Driggs, Idaho and Jackson, Wyoming. So tourism economy in Palm Springs, working class people not able to afford to live in that town. I feel like I had pretty good credentials. Now, sadly, I was a kid and then I was a teenager and teenagers are obligated to feel that they are living in a very boring place. So right, as a right. teenager, I just thought, oh, this is so sad that I have ended up in this really, land in this really boring place. But looking back at it, I thought, man, pretty much the center of the action. And then we had for a while here at the Santa American West, we had a funny man, an odd man, who thought that California had to be excluded from the West. And so he drew up our first uh, program for a certificate of Western American studies, just eliminating the West. Now for a historian, excuse me, eliminating California from the West, that is hard for a historian because a lot of people in the 1840s and 1850s start across the country and then vanish uh, at the foothills of the Sierras on the eastern side. If we, if we can't have California in Western history, we have some pretty peculiar episodes of the Overland Trail ending basically nowhere. So, so that didn't really work for us to do that. Plus, I would say there's more and more reason to think of the Pacific Ocean as more of a place of, of lively exchange with the world than the Atlantic in some ways. So, sure. so, that, uh, so much trade, so much uh, important international relations happening on the Pacific, and so to the degree that the West claims the Pacific, we'd better hold on to California. Right, right. Um, you're, a fast, you're a fast talker and a fast thinker. And I feel like, I am, I feel like I'm moving in slow motion right now. It's funny. Um, I, you know, you are a woman who wears many hats, uh, from what I understand. Um, oh, and I think, oh, and here's one of the hats now. Oh yes, that would be your. Um, let's see, which. That's the academic. Hat. That's the academic hat. Okay. Yes, I, I. That looks familiar. Right. So you. British or European kind of version that not the not the square, not the rectangular thing. But when you think of yourself, do you think of yourself as primarily an academic? No. 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 Whoops. All right. Okay. No. Wait, here. There. More of that. Aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> Now, did you, you didn't wear those in Banning, did you? Oh, that's the most ridiculous thing to bring up now that you didn't know. I don't think we talked about this. Uh, my father had a place called the California Date Shop. Uh, my mother worked full time as a legal secretary. My father sold dates, not as in uh, human to human dates, but as in, as in dates from date palms right. and shakes and, and chocolate covered dates and so on. So he had a store there uh, that was my daycare center, daycare center. So uh, I, that was where I was when I was a, a tiny child on up. And somewhere when I was about four or five years old, my mother and father bought me some cowgirl clothes. And so when my father's customers driving from Los Angeles to Palm Springs and back, uh, they would stop and they would come in the store and they'd go, where's the cowgirl? So there she, here she is, right. Little friend jacket and so, so it was, but I was not uh, in the least bit authentic, but then the greater share of people wearing Western wear are not particularly authentic as cowgirls or cowboys either. So, so I guess in that way I was more typical, but yes, uh, I did have this kind of stuff. This is actually a Stetson. It's I, really, it's really smart. I really like the, it's a nice white Stetson. Yeah. It's, but it is, you did call me a public intellectual. I did. And, uh, uh, this is probably more my public intellectual dress. And did you did you embrace the cowboy hat here in Colorado to kind of blend blend in? Well, it's a no? complicated story. Uh, for a while, as a younger young person, I was trying to keep my distance from the Western myth, the Western romance, uh, 
I was, in fact, debunking that. Much of what I was writing as a historian was debunking that. And then for various reasons, I questioned the allocation of energy I was putting into debunking the Western myth. And I decided that I might try to co-opt it and use it for better purposes. And there's very good reasons to do that. So I did uh, change my presentation of self and I did acquire cowboy hats, cowboy boots, fringe leather jackets. I should have worn one of those right now. Uh, and I think I also learned two-step dancing. That was mm. harder than buying the clothes, I'll say by a long shot, but I, I can do two-step and triple-step dancing. And I've always liked Western music. So I, I felt that would be, if you can't, but it wasn't exactly if you can't beat them, join them, but that I might have more credibility if I, if I didn't fight the uh, insignia. And now I actually feel very good about it. I feel really happy to have that. And I'm, I've, I guess I've always worn colorful things, but it was really fun to just think I'm going all in, in the Western wear thing. My, fa my father wrote for Republic Films in Hollywood and he oh. had become quite skeptical of, of Western uh, portrayal on screen. So I probably took a little bit of time working that out in my relationship with my departed father and deciding that Okay, he was very <clears throat> cynical about Western movies, but I love Western movies and I always watch Western movies uh, dreaming that the cowboy hero will come into my life and bring order to it. Oh yeah, yeah. What well, top three Western Westerns for you? Well, I, uh, that's a very tough question because I would, I would want to say some of the things like Stand and Deliver, that wonderful movie about the uh, Latino man yeah. teaching school and motivating students that's set in the West. It's set in East our LA. So I try sometimes to push against the boundary of that, but I, I watched with the wonderful Howie Moshewitz, one of the great cultural resources in our area, the film critic. I've, I've done discussions of uh, the searchers a number of times with him and with another friend in film studies here, Dan Board, the stagecoach. Um, and I always end up and Sh well, Shane and Stagecoach are probably the ones that I spent the most time thinking about. But good heavens, the, to think that those are all just positive celebrations of Western men is really missing how hard it is for the, for the classic Western hero to come in, play an important part in a town, and then have to leave. That's the role of the Western hero is to leave and to think of it as a romanticized life that we would all enjoy if we could be cowboys. That's really doing a disservice, I think, to the filmmakers who, who made much more uh, difficult, challenging thought. Anybody who watches John Wayne and The Searchers is not going to say, oh, I would like to be like that. Right. Haunted, desperate, murderous. <laughs> I mean, no, actually, that doesn't seem, well, who knows, maybe some people would enjoy that, but the great majority of humanity would think, no, I don't want to see that. So, so I do like Western movies, but I, I have a very simple-minded wish that, that a John Wayne-like character would come into my life and take over uh, responding to emails and would just keep <laughs> responding by saying the John Wayne character would say, the little lady has enough messages as it is now. Okay. <laughs> The little lady doesn't need any more messages. <laughs> well, thank you for responding to my email. I, oh, I, I'm I glad that I didn't get John Wayne. <laughs> that would have freaked me out. Right. I suppose there's no, I guess there's so much fraudulent activity in the internet now. I suppose I could just create my own John Wayne answering service, but. Well, would you wear that hat? Or would uh, you wear well, a different hat? That, which is a. So I've been happy. Oh, yeah. I got this hat at the Elko Cowboy Poetry Gathering uh, 15, 16 years ago. So this is a really comes from a good place. Did you read poetry at that event? You have a real poet sitting there with you. And, oh, and yeah. me, you have a writer of uh, doggerel verse and limericks. <laughs> <laughs> doggerel so, verse and limericks. Yeah. yeah well, Right, and mostly doggerel verse. So I was actually just giving a speech at the Elko Cowboy Poetry Gallery. Oh, okay, Gallery. okay. Hopefully again soon. Um, but I certainly have a good cupboard full of limericks. If That only seems appropriate, of course. 
Um, we, you know, we had a cowboy poet here last year. He was phenomenal. He could yodel. He had a dog that yodeled. No. Yeah. Yeah, yodeled with him. It was incredible. We do a lot here. Yeah, you're, if, yeah, if you're just tuning in, tune back in, because uh, to keep tuned in, yeah. Yeah, guys, I saw a couple, when I was in college, I did a lot of stuff with um, elderly people, which I'm now turning into one, but back in those days, I went to a talent show where a couple, a very nice older couple, probably in their 80s, maybe, maybe 90s, they sang of the song, The Indian Love Call, which I wouldn't recommend as a song, but they had a chihuahua who howled along with them. And I've never forgotten that performance. That was the most amazing performance of these two people singing the Indian Love Call, call and every once in a while the chihuahua just throwing its head back and howling. Kind Did, of in Was it a biter? They all are, I think. No. They all are, see, yeah, you gotta watch out for those little, little mouths, right. yeah. Can't fault them in a way because they have to catch up in some way. And beauty, no, not going to happen. And scale, really, really lost. So I'm not encouraging them to bite, but I can see why they do it. The same. Um, I can't figure out a great segue here, but there are other hats I, I think that you wear that we had talked about. Um, and uh, oh, see, here's here's another hat. Who knew, like people tuning in are like, oh, we're gonna, we're gonna hear from Patty Limerick. She's gonna speak very, she's gonna break down Western, you know, Western history for us or something. But no, no, we're gonna talk about hats. Yes. Because this uh, is the long monster. Yes, and this is, a, this is probably the, uh, the best track of my career. I was the, uh, initially I was an applicant to be the official Yale fool when I was a graduate student. I, asked the president of the university to appoint me as the official Yale fool. There's some dispute as to whether he did that or not, but he accepted, the president of Yale accepted my resignation as the official fool of Yale when I left Yale. Now, I cannot think why anyone would ever accept a resignation of someone who didn't actually hold the job. So we had a little dispute. He didn't, he claimed he had never appointed me fool, but he did accept my resignation. Then I went to Harvard as an assistant professor and I became the official Harvard fool. And for that, I had a very beautiful ceremony with the president of Harvard and the dean of the, uh, of Harvard University congratulating me. I was in clown makeup. Um, it was, it was very beautiful. Unfortunately, I had bought some new clown makeup that I had not tried before. And it took me uh, two or three days to get that off my face after that particular <laughs> ceremony. So there is some risk there that I hadn't, hadn't expected. But I did have a wonderful time as an official fool and then uh, a wonderful form of community outreach. There's no better way to meet people than to go out as a fool. And then I came to Boulder and not long after that, <clears throat> the uh, rival, the Dane appointed me the official fool <clears throat> of the College of Arts and Sciences. And then I guess that made the president feel a little bit competitive. So I was appointed the official fool of the University of Colorado and I was renewed maybe four years ago with uh, no term limit. This was quite exciting. Mm -hmm. The previous appointment had had a term limit, but this one just goes, I guess, into eternity. So I am the official fool of the University of Colorado. And I find that I have acquired quite a few hats in that process. So oh, that's a, that's a gorgeous one. This is over the top, really. Well, yeah, over the top. Well, most right. hats are. Yeah, um, <laughs> do you see what I did there? Yeah. Um, that's gorgeous. So were you the, uh, were you the uh, inaugural uh, fool at Harvard? Or did they, yes. con yeah? Yeah, this is, uh, this is the more classic fool's hat, but sort of more of the medieval tradition. Oh, yeah. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Is that, so, that's kind of more historically accurate or something, yeah. yeah. I guess that should be historically accurate, I'm not sure. I, this is, it's I really... Was, I, I hated these hats. It's very darling, hats. actually. Because they made me feel more like an idiot than a fool. But now <laughs> I'm a crossover and I recognize the power of the symbol system and, I, and I'm proud of having all these hats. I have several of them that no, I haven't even put on yet. So I wanted, uh, I took a very good workshop from a man named Bill Carpenter who had revived the tradition of the fool. No medieval king could claim to be anything in life if he didn't have an official fool. And the understanding in the medieval era was that if you didn't have an official fool, 
you really, really courted bad luck because you, the king should have one person who could speak frankly to the king, honestly to the king, risk the king's wrath and not end up punished or hurt. So that really was a tradition, and anyone who's read Shakespeare or seen Shakespeare knows that that tradition was really important, that King Lear had no friends except for the fool. The only person who would go out into the storm with King Lear was the, was the loyal fool. So it's really important to have fools. The mistaken notion was that fools were necessary in the medieval era with monarchy, aristocracy, but that we needed fools, or did not need fools at all when we had a democratic republic that could be fool free and boy was that a mistake yeah it, it seems like mistake. it are, are fools now fools were uh, appointed are, are, are they also elected do we, we also uh, elect okay. fools this is a distinction of extreme importance yeah um, i as you'll notice in my array here i am an official fool i am openly out in public as an official fool. There are thousands, that's an underestimate, of closet fools, small f fools. I'm mm. a capital F fool. The small f fools are out pretending to be any number of other things. <laughs> that's very dangerous. They are closet fools and it's very dangerous. So I don't have any kinship really with the closet fools. I urge them to come out and be forthright. Come but out, come, out. come out, come out wherever you are, yeah. Oh, are you frozen? Oh no, oh, you froze for a second there, but you're back. Yes. Oh. I think said it was able to be back now. So um, anyway, so the hope was that if I set an example at Yale and Harvard, that that would spread and every public official of note, uh, every secretary of defense, every secretary of state would think, well, I must have a fool. That's important, <laughs> uh, an important figure is you have to have a fool because the fool speaks frankly when no one else dares to. That's important. But that discharges bad luck. So my dream uh, has come in a little bit short of, of the goal line there, but it still seems like a really, really good idea. So yes, closet fools have run for public office. Right, right. That so is very dangerous. In order to be an official full fool, you have to self-identify first. You do. Right, you okay, do. okay. Because when I was appointed, for instance, when I was appointed, well, I've been appointed at, at three different universities, if I had not asked for that, if I had received an announcement from the president of Yale University that he had appointed me the official fool, without <laughs> my having asked for that, that yeah. would have been very hurtful. Yeah, I can see how that might be the case. But if yeah. you choose it, there's nothing more joyful about it. When I, when I was a very, actually, I mean, I was really nervous at first. I was, graduates in Yale, really nervous about wanting to come out as a fool. And I would put on my clown makeup. It's kind of like uh, Superman. I would slip into the basement of the big library, go into the restroom there, put on my clown makeup, put on my colorful clothes, to go. and then, okay. um, Sorry. oh dear, I've driven some people, well, some people are. Oh no, <laughs> Peter's got to go be a dad, I think. Oh, okay. Okay, so uh, anyway, so I would come out of the, out of the basement as a fool, and I would think, this could be very dangerous. If I am hoping to get a PhD here, I, this could be quite dangerous. But what I saw every time I would appear on campus, very solemn, a kind of pompous professors would see me, all colorful, and they would look like tiny children who didn't realize they were going to go to the circus and who found themselves at the circus. So there would be a moment where a really pompous, really solemn professor would look at me and just light up and then try to bring that back down into a properly solemn mode. But it was so delightful just to see these moments where they just looked just childlike and uh, cheerful to see that. So I, I did every once in a while, I'd, I'd take a, a friend or student out with me in clown makeup and I'd say, you have to watch for that first five second, probably less than that, four and a half second moment where the a, a solemn person sees a fool, which is not to be confused with a clown. I'm not a clown, but the fool and the colorfulness and the openness of it, it's really fun. I used to walk around uh, the Yale campus with a, a, a sandwich board that said, uh, official fool, congratulations, any occasion. And then I would walk up to people and say, 
what should I congratulate you on? And they'd say, well, I don't, I'm not sure. And I'd say, well, you must know. And so then they would tell me something they'd accomplished. I could congratulate them. Mm -hmm. It's great. I had a sandwich board that said official fool, encouragement, any good cause. And I could walk around and encourage people on causes I would never, it was wonderful. So it is still a wonderful thing. I don't have as much time for it as I used to. And then as the official fool at CU, you're, you're, you can go into any meeting at any time and just, mm -hmm. right. And, uh, and disrupt. I, uh, I can, I can interrupt. I can, uh, I have not done, I used to have a couple of administrators who would go with me. I used to have a dean who would, who would take me around and say, here's the official fool. I'm the king. <laughs> Welcome us here. I, I do feel that I have a authority that the tradition, I mean, it is actually a wonderful, wonderful tradition that humanity has there and many different cultures have it, not just, not just medieval Europe. Uh, but I feel that if I walk into a room and I am the official fool of the university and things aren't going well in that room, if there's a meeting that has gone off the tracks and become contentious, I am entirely licensed to take over and to run the meeting. That's I'm fantastic. The I would like to invite you to do that here at the museum occasionally. I'm, I'm there. I'll be there. Well, I, as soon as I get a little bit less paranoid about Right, yeah, 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 yeah. We do have a lot of uh, disinfecting uh, solutions here. Yeah, I see that giant container. Yeah, it's huge. And it has a Longmont sticker on it. We branded it uh, Longmont. Um, you know, I, I don't want to freak you out, Patty, but it's that time, you know. Okay. Uh, are, okay. you, are you ready for this? Um, ladies and gentlemen, it's the moment we've all been waiting for. Yep. It's time for everybody's favorite new quiz, You're So Vrain, the Longmont History Quiz, with the man who literally wrote the book on Longmont, the museum's curator of history, Mr. Eric Mason. You're so vain. Probably think this song is about you. You're so afraid. Where you think the song is about you? Don't you? Don't you? Don't you? Don't you? Hi, Eric. Hi, Justin. Welcome to the Long Monster. Hey, it's good to be here. Well, before we get going, I want to make sure that, well, you know, we did lose one of our guests because he has to go. Um, put a pizza in the oven for his son or something. Uh, so Peter's no longer with us. So it's going to be, uh, it's going to come down to Patty and Norma here. Uh, you'll be the first ever to play the You're So Vrain Longmont History Quiz. And uh, Patty, you may be a historian, but Norma has actually lived in Longmont. So she may have a leg up here. Um, I'm going to give you, Norma, this little paddle, um, which you can raise if you'd like to answer the question. If you feel like you have the answer, raise that paddle, and we will call on you. Patty, do you have a paddle? Yes. Of course you do. Um, you were quite the ping pong player at some point. In my, in my day, I in, was spectacular. In your day. And I, oh, in your day. A lot of people are still uh, feeling their injuries over how badly I beat them when I was a kid. But if you ever come back out of retirement, out of ping pong retirement, let me know, because I'd love to be humiliated by you and your well, paddle. I, 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 there's been a serious decline in this, but. Okay, okay. I, yeah. so, um, so I think you have some questions for us, don't you? And we I have do a prize. Indeed. So be in it to oh. win it, ladies. Oh. Okay. All right, <laughs> our first question. What sweet substance did Longmont produce millions of pounds of annually between 1904 and 1976? I'm afraid Patty beat you to it, Norma. <laughs> yes, Patty. I think it might be the only one I will get, probably, but sugar beets. Yes, that is correct. I was going right. to say that. Very good. You were going to say that. Norma was going to say that. That's what I always say. I was going to say that. I'm going downhill really fast, Norma, so you're... Okay, you're, <laughs> okay. You just got to be quicker on the, you know, on the raising on the, the paddle. On the paddle, yeah. okay. Yeah. I got All it now. Right. But maybe wait until we get to the end of the question to raise your paddle. Okay. <laughs> okay, question number two. 
What mountain, whose first documented climb was by a party led by John Wesley Powell, is Longmont named for? Yes, Norma. Long's Peak? Yes, indeed. Ding, 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 ding. <laughs> all right. All right. We're, we're, tie, we're all tied up. It couldn't get any closer. This is a real nail biter. <laughs> all right. Question number three. What astronaut was born at 613 Lincoln Street in Longmont? I'm, I'm oh, yes, Patty. Uh, Scott Carpenter seems so associated with Colorado that I'm going to try for Scott Carpenter. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm afraid that's, yeah, that's, uh, do we have, are we giving up here? We uh, have, we have, yeah, yeah okay, all right. What is the answer? Eric? All right, that would be Vance Brand, for whom Vance Brand Airport here in Longmont is named. And Vance Brand Auditorium as well. Okay. Yes, indeed. But I didn't want to mention a rival, you know. Oh, thank you, Eric. <laughs> we have no rivals. I learned something. Okay. All right. Question four. What author mentions napping at a Longmont gas station in his most famous book? Patty. Kerouac? Jack Kerouac? Yes. Yes. You oh. got it. Yeah. Ding, 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 ding. <laughs> okay. That's two to one. Two to one. Uh -oh. Patty is in the lead. <laughs> Time for a big comeback. All right. Question five. What structure did Longmont build in 1939, making it the first town west of the Mississippi to have one? <laughs> oh. uh, you raise your paddle if you know the answer. <laughs> yes, Norma. Water tower? Yes, close enough. <laughs> oh, wow. It wow, was Norma, a you really know your Longmont stuff. <laughs> a monopole water tower. A um, monopole water unlike tower. Unlike the old ones that had the big struts and all, <laughs> ours just has a single shaft. And it's still okay. there, yeah? It's still there. It yeah. is now a historic landmark. Oh boy. Mm. Oh boy. Up by Sunset yeah. Pool. Mm -hmm. If you've ever been. Oh. Okay, so we're all tied up at yes. two two. <laughs> So, and that means we are up for our tiebreaker. <laughs> Got to go into overtime here. Tiebreaker question. What is Longmont's official elevation? Oh, dear, oh, dear, oh, dear. We're going to give them, like, if they're, if they're within 100. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Anyway. All right. Oh, boy. Uh, you raise or your even paddle. 500. <laughs> Well, Denver's the mile high city, right. and I believe that's 5,000 something. Oh, looks like oh, Patty yes, has her Patty, paddle up. Patty. I, I don't, this is very, you'll notice this is a very wobbly paddle. <laughs> it's just really going back and forth. So I'm going for uh, 5,000 and, oh, excuse me, yeah, 5,350. Ooh. That's, uh, <laughs> that's, uh, I'm sorry, that is incorrect. Uh, okay, I'll give it a try. Okay, uh, yes, Norma. Uh, 6,000. Oh. Oh, that's even more incorrect. Yep. <laughs> we're just, uh, we're getting further and further away. So yeah. I'm afraid neither of you have answered the, uh, the, the bonus, the tiebreaker question, and which leaves us still uh, at a total... We, we, we can't call this one. It's too close to call. <laughs> um, we're going to have to get back to you, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to count up these. What's that? Hold your breath. Oh, what is the answer, Eric? The answer, which is on all of the signs leading into Longmont, in case you've ever noticed, is 4,979 feet. Yeah, right. Oh. Yeah, well, where is that, and where is that measured from, Eric? Ah, that's a very good question. Um, if you think about where Denver's mile high is measured from, you might get a clue of where Longmont's is measured from. 
Longmont's is from the bottom step of the old city hall on 4th Avenue. Oh. There's still a benchmark in the step to this day. Well, what do you know? I think we all know a little more about Longmont now than we did when we started. I'm going to go ahead and award you both with a prize. Uh, Patty, we're going to have to ship this off to you or specially, special deliver it. Yes, it's sugar beets. <laughs> Longmont would not exist if it were not for sugar beets. I am going to go ahead and uh, bestow Norma with this sugar beet on behalf of uh, the people of Longmont and the Longmont Museum. We'd like to have uh, you take this home with you as a special token of our appreciation for appearing on this, the first Long Monster. And uh, we have yet another one. It's smaller, uh, Patty, but I, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's more uh, uh, natural. <laughs> you, can you see it okay? Do you see it? I, I can certainly see it. And it's I quite handsome. You know, if, I mean, Eric, I don't know if you, you, you can tell us a little bit about um, how, I mean, we wouldn't have Longmont if, if it weren't for these sugar beets. Am I right or am I wrong? Certainly, the sugar was a key commodity in Longmont, and those beets made people a lot of money for a lot of years. They also led to a lot of suffering because uh, growing them is a back-breaking amount of work. Today, it's all mechanized, so... I uh, don't have to worry about uh, blood beats or anything anymore. All right. Well, um, don't eat that all at once, Norma. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I got a whole posse here. We'll share it. Yeah, 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 share. <laughs> Sharing is caring. Anyway, I want to thank all of our guests. Peter, who is now at home, I'm sure, tucking his 15-year-old his in the bed or something. Um, Norma Johnson, thank you for joining us. Patty. Thanks for being such a good sport and joining us on your Zoom, your Zoom machine from your den there. What is your cat's name? I saw your cat kind of sneak through at some point. Yes, my, my sister gave me that cat for various reasons, and she has been at, uh, visited Israel a lot. And in Hebrew, when someone says to you, how's it going, how are you? The answer, if you want to say fine, basically, you say yofi. Yofi. Uh, yofi. As it, it really, it means beautiful, I guess, in Hebrew. But if somebody says, how's it going? And I'm not sure how often we get to say that these days. But if we want to say, just beautiful, just great, uh, then, we, then Yofi is what we would say. So my cat is named Yofi, and she totally lives up to that. She well, really Yofi. She has a great attitude. If you guys were here, she would be so happy. She just, she loves visitors. So Norma and Justin and Eric, I hope that you will come visit me and Yofi at some point. Oh, well, thank you. I think we'd be delighted to meet Yofi. I'm a Jeez, cat guy. I'm not asking on Yofi's behalf so much as my own. I would enjoy that very much to have you visit here. And thank you for uh, putting up with me from a remote location. Well, thank, thank you. Thank you for joining us. And I want to thank all of you out there in Internet land for uh, joining us as well. We're going to be doing this. Uh, it's not going to be every week. It's not going to be every month. It's going to be twice a year. So you can look forward to another Long Monster in March-ish. March. I'm going to just go ahead and commit to sometime in the month of March on a Thursday. So mark your calendars. Um, we'll see you then. Thank you, everybody. Thank you to our band, Dave yeah. Tamgen and Company. And we look forward to possibly having a real live audience one of these days, physically present audience, of course. Um, I hope you get through this, uh, this long election night, and uh, we'll see you on the other side. Yeah. Until then. Bye, everybody.